as you know, this is part of our alumni speaker series. Uh, Bonnie is another C7. You've seen a, a few and you'll probably connect with a few more, but uh, we do have more cohorts than just C7. I think Bonnie's about to, yeah, that's perfect. Um, we do have a lot to kind of cover and benefit from Bonnie's time. Uh, super appreciative of it. And again, this is uh, it's a, it's a unique and challenging time with this COVID and distance and everything that goes with it. A lot of us are working from home and um, but one of the perks to me is being able to connect with our alumni network in this way. And, you know, Bonnie has a, a, such a unique story and I'm still a huge fan of the pitch project. I hope we get to that at some point in the, uh, in the presentation too, because we'll cover that. Hopefully we'll leave some time for Q and A at the end. We do have a hard stop at the, uh, the 50 minute mark. So I'm going to keep it short. Bonnie has an amazing, to Larry's earlier introduction, amazing background coming into the program. She's amazing within it. And she's had a really interesting career journey out of the MDM and she's still connected. So um, without f further ado, here's Bonnie. Bonnie, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dennis. Um, I'm gonna ask you to be kind of my um, clock keeper if I'm moving to just ask me to move along. And, I will be know. doing that, no problem. <laughs> awesome. Um, cool, Th uh, thanks Dennis, and hi everyone. I can't see your faces, but um, I'm hoping you're listening. Um, I'm not gonna start with my intro because who I am doesn't really matter a lot. Um, what I'm trying to do here is um, for the last eight years, for some reason, there's been always questions that have been asked and people always reach out. And I've taken some of those questions and kind of framed my presentation around um, those questions, hoping that they'd help uh, you in some way, shape or form. And um, so without further ado, let me switch the slide. Okay, so um, because I like food, I'm gonna dish it out as a three course meal. Um, the Through CDM lives in the last eight years has been kind of modularized into the CDM life, uh, what I call the entrepreneur life, and then just the job and career. Um, and that's how I'm gonna talk about uh, my experience through these three, um, I guess, phases. Um, let's address the elephant in the room. Um, what does Masters of Digital Media even mean? Um, and trust me, eight years later, you still have to answer that question every single time, and it doesn't get easier. <laughs> so my first tip to you is figure out what you're gonna say for 45 seconds. Just pick a university, explain what you feel would represent the most because you're gonna to have to say that a lot. In multiple forms, you're gonna fail in the networking events. Um, so until the end of time, um, just pick what you feel the program is. Uh, for me, I just pick, uh, it's a general credit program uh, where we learn things all about digital media from games to websites to strategy. And as you move along, you're gonna learn and add more of your experience. So you can just sprinkle that in there. Um, but what does it actually mean? Um, it's, it's very difficult to put it in words. I'm trying to, so I've tried to break it, broken it, break it down into like three pits. First is it teaches how to collaborate. And I'm sure Dennis has um, talked about this and Larry has talked about this, but it truly does. Um, a small anecdote uh, to explain that is um, uh, first week with CDM, I came in and um, I have a developer background. So I was a programmer for two years before I came into CDM. And I met a friend of mine who is an artist. And I'm sure Larry and Dennis know who I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, that was this literally first week. And uh, there was a game jam that was happening. And I've never been in game jams or hackathons or anything before. And we we're like, uh, but you're an artist, I'm a programmer, piece of cake. I mean, I mean, that, that's a no brainer. So we applied for the game jam like a day or day ago. And that was, I still remember that was a Monday. And we said Sunday evening, let's just spend two hours figuring out what we want to do. And then we can just go in and, you know, we just win this thing. Um, long story short, we didn't talk for three days and we didn't go to the game jam. <laughs> the main reason was we, um, we had no idea how to talk in each other's language and understand each other. And that's what collaboration truly means. Um, she was an artist uh, expecting me to understand and take her ideas and structure them in a way I could understand. And I was like, I can't, this is a game that needs to be a middle part, then a start and an end, there are variables involved. What are you talking about? Um, but that was the first experience that really helped me understand how much more I needed to understand um, talking to different kinds of people. And a year and a half, almost yeah, a year later, she's, uh, she was actually my business partner 
in the company that I started. And uh, she's one of the people I love collaborating with even um, after CDM, we have projects that we collaborated with and um, that's what it does, you know, that's what it teaches. Next thing is um, you'll obviously learn from your teachers and they're great people here. You're gonna have a lot of skill sets that you're gonna take away from the program. But one of the things we did as C7s, and I'm not sure if it's just us, um, we were very ambitious and curious people. So we had artists and directors and programmers, videographers, photographers, like you name it. We had everyone in our program. And we always went and asked them, hey, how do you, how do you use the software or how do, you, how do you do this? So I think almost for the first two sims, almost every single day we had a lunch session that was given by our peers. And I think I learned as much from my peers as I learned from my teachers. And um, they were incredible because sometimes it's just people being nice and trying to share what they know and their expertise. And sometimes it's just 10 people going and holding someone saying that, hey, I really don't know how to use this topic. Can you give us a tutorial? And that's kind of, I guess, one of the best parts about the program that I learned so many different things, which I never imagined I could. Um, and that didn't come from the teachers. Um, the um, last bit, which is the most important bit and a segue to my next slide is don't think too hard if you know if you don't know where you're going um i'm going to take the liberty to say most of the success stories that came out of the program were people who had no idea what they wanted to do uh, when they came into the program and um I, I have a feeling you've heard this again over and over again when people have talked about cdm being a safe ground but i truly um want to reiterate that that if you have thought about trying something you want to learn something this is the place explore 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 um think about the journey not too much about the destination because you know what i didn't imagine if you asked me it is i going to be a program manager in an e-commerce company i had no idea i was going to do that i had a very different idea of what i thought i wanted to do and here's like a small list of off the top of my head, the things that I've done, I've done things like going to game jams and volunteering hackathons, created a card game, volunteering at animation events. Uh, we also presented at Facebook, um, learned Unity, also made my first movie trailer, decided that was too much work because that was another career choice I had. I also learned to actually take good pictures from a pro, um, gave my first programming lesson, created a game from scratch, um, learned and taught UX in the same program itself. Um, ended up building my own company. And the last but the most important one, I did make 20 people cry when I made the Watch a Bollywood movie. Um, but the point here is um, explore everything that's out there. There's a reason why it's called digital media. Um, and there's an opportunity to learn as much as you can from the people in this program, as much as around you. Um, the next question that moves around is like, okay, so um, I'm in the program, I'm here, I'm doing things, what can I be? Without sign sounding too cliched, um, you, you can't be anything. Um, just off of my experience, I had a developer background, I've done software development for a few years, bachelor's in computer science. Uh, before I came into the program, I thought I loved animation. I wanted to be an animator. Then I saw how much hard work that was. Then I thought I'm going to be a UX designer, which I did most of my, which I, which I just forced everyone in CDM to make sure that I could do not program, but actually learn UX, which I did. Thankfully, they gave me the opportunity to take on that role. Um, I also said no to an internship as a developer. Also said no to a position as an information architect out of the program. And all of them ended, um, I just ended up starting my own company for a year, which um, I'm gonna talk about in the next uh, main course mail. So, um, I don't know how much it's part of Dennis or everyone's pitch, but it is a place for people who want to be an entrepreneur. Not saying it's not for others, but especially if you have that, that drive, that, that itch, um, you're in the right place. But at the crossroads, um, when we were at, uh, I think that I still remember it was like Feb, and um, people were talking about internships um, in the future. And then they were also talking about, hey, you got to present something if you want to do an entrepreneurship and you have to do it now. And a view, I did it with four of my friends and we were like, oh my God, are we doing the right thing? Like they're missing an internship. Like that's money, <laughs> that's uh, connections, that's experience, that's literally leading you right to the door. Um, is it the right thing to do? 
So worry not. If you answer yes to all of these questions, ideally, then don't worry, you're doing the right thing. So the first question is, did you really have an idea that's nagging at you? And there are some people who comes at it and sometimes it comes, it doesn't come, but either it's your idea or someone else, your friend who's pitching you that you feel equally passionate about. Um, do you have a team that believes in you? And this one is a really important one because you don't find that, trust me, I've had an internship, uh, I've had a, a company, we stopped it, I moved ahead in my career and starting a company is not easy when you're doing, when you're outside. Um, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, the next one is if you have you always wondered what it is to start a company and um, that was a high yes for me. Um, this one's also important. Do you have medium to high risk tolerance? Um, you can't have a low risk tolerance and be an entrepreneur. So um, it's totally fine if you don't, but if you are, you've got to make sure that you have that kind of mindset of being able to fail and move on. Um, and the last one, yeah, do you not care if you don't sleep for a year? And that year could be multiple years. We did it for a year and we didn't sleep. So um, that was just my translation of sleep for my... Um, awesome. I'm going to give you a breather here because I want to touch on for everyone on the call what this process looks like because it's you're still early in your MDM career, but Bonnie and her classmates um, got to know each other in this first term, much like many of you are doing right now. Heading into the second term, there's going to be a point where you're gonna be thinking about what you wanna do moving out of the program. And for the third term, you have an option to pitch as a team, which we call the, pit, the pitch project process. I don't <laughs> want to you, I'm gonna stumble over that. But pitch projects. And Bonnie and her classmates came up with a concept and had to go through our version of a Dragon's Den. I don't know if that Canadian television show resonates with everyone on this call, but basically <laughs> you have to pitch to an external panel and have your idea validated in that sense to get a green light to move forward with it. And then the internship term follows the pitch project. But anyway, wanted to give you a breather, a sip of water and add a little flavor to this. So around end of February, early March, you, you may have the opportunity to be, be pitching yourselves, uh, thinking ahead um, about rolling out a company and the pros and cons of it. Right back to you, Bonnie. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Dennis. That was good context. Um, yep. And like you said, um, that's around the second term. And um, yeah, that's, that, was, that was really fun. Uh, and it was a dragon's den, yes. Um, um, how much ever um, in the classroom it was, and it's not dragon's den, you, you, you're terrified uh, as a student when you're getting there. Um, but anyhow, so in our pitch project, uh, once we got greenlit and we had to start working on it, um, in retrospect, um, there were a few things now I want to talk about why CDM was the place where um, we started a company and we could start our company. And if someone is, has answered yes to all of those, you should. Uh, two very big things. First one's um, the support system. Um, the kind of support system you get in CDM, you're not going to get um, outside. And no, Dennis did not pay me to tell that. Um, it is once in a lifetime opportunity. You get, you get mentorship, you get office space, things you don't realize when you're a student, which actually you need money for, um, you get that here. Um, um, we've got funding, uh, we've got bursaries. Um, don't get me wrong, we all did our part-time jobs. Like we had to continue to kind of survive and we did that. But the other stuff around it um, is something that is so much more additional that you can't get out of CDM um, from funding to mentorship to the office space and all of that combined. Um, and the next big reason I think it, it really helped me was Vancouver is kind of this, you know, Silicon Valley type of our Canada. You have tons of startup. There's, it's like brimming with ideas. There's a startup coming up almost every month. There's meetups happening. People talk about it. There's funding. There's VCs. There's, there's a lot of buzz around uh, startup and the government helps uh, startups a lot here. So being in Vancouver and understanding even the lingo and the language and how things work um, was incredible. We got an opportunity to present in so many places, got crushed, um, had no idea what funding meant, what seed funding, angel series, I had no freaking idea. Um, I still remember we presented in Facebook because we got selected in one of the um, uh, competitions uh, as women entrepreneurs or something. And we were so gung-ho and we're like, this is awesome. We're going to kill it. And we, we had a prototype. We didn't even have, we didn't have business model. We didn't have user base. 
and they crushed us because after the presentation, they're like, how many users do you have? How many, um, what's your growth rate like? What's your forecasting? I'm like, what? I mean, and that's when like all of those experience kind of help give context to what a startup life looks like. Like you can't go ask for like a series of funding, for example, if you don't have a user base um, and the other people presenting, for example, had a fully functional beta product with they needed funding to grow their product. And we were like, oh, we're just trying to build a product. Um, but anyways, the point here is um, it helps you understand a lot of different pieces in Vancouver um, and how startup works. We ended up applying for um, E at UBC, which is a program at UBC where um, all like very early stage startups apply and we got selected. I think there were like six people. And they um, teach you, uh, it's a replica kind of of a class that Steve Blank um, does and used to do in US. I don't know how many of you have heard about Steve Blank, but he's basically kind of the founder of the lean startup movement and that was 10 years ago. So it was pretty much around the time that we were starting up and very few people knew about it. Now it's common knowledge, it's been accepted by what 100 universities and people teach all over the place, but uh, UBC was one of the very few um, universities at that time who was teaching, who was taking that program and teaching early entrepreneurs how to build their market and product market fit. Now we did this in, I think six months after we, sp we spent like trying to build our product. And after this uh, program, we realized we didn't have a product market fit or we didn't have the money to sustain and figure out what that would look like. So if someone had showed me this video, Eight years ago, I think life would have been very different. Um, and I'm gonna use this opportunity to show at least a few bits. I'm not gonna show the whole thing. Um, so anyone who's interested, it's just a really cool thing to know about and you can go later and read about him. Um, it's an incredible um, framework for startups. Dennis, was there anything you wanted to add? Yeah, just my disappointment about the company not becoming, I mean, it, this was pre-Slack and Miro. I mean, I, I, I remember know. elements of it and all the the potential, um, but I, I still applaud everyone on that team that did everything you did. And again, th this idea of pursuing that entrepreneurial path, even within the safety net of the MDM, you all are still successful in your, your own right and your careers and the paths that you're on. And, you know, Ivy's doing, she's a senior UX designer with an EA now, right? And she, she was actually a guest speaker a few weeks ago too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's great to hear. But anyway, it's uh, not much. I'm, I'm just, I was nodding along and going, you know, it was, it's amazing. It's still, Buo is an amazing product that you were working on. I'm, I'm going to, I think I'm going to share the link with everyone after this, just so they can check out the page. I think Russell's voice is still in the video, so it's... Oh, yep. <laughs> Russell's voice is still in the video. It's funny you mentioned, Dennis, because I still keep getting, like, on and off messages from, like, the 500 people we spoke to, and they're like, hey, is it still on? I'm like, nope, it isn't. And uh, it's very ironic. Um, and just to give everyone context, um, so Orbits, which was our new name, uh, because you told Bo was awful. <laughs> um, uh, it was basically a platform where we uh, built, um, now like Slack, remote teams could collaborate. So the idea was it was a digital brainstorming tool for uh, teams to collaborate and ideate better. Um, there were many reasons we couldn't continue, but um, like Dennis said, we were really passionate about the idea and we spoke to, we tried to solve all the world's problem of digital collaboration in one product. And that was kind of one of the reasons why we couldn't find the product market fit. Um, but yeah, that was, that was, that was our product. Um, so yeah, in my interviews or even in my conversations with people, uh, they're like, seriously in COVID, like you could have had, you could have made money. I'm like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> be good. Um, anyhow, moving along. Um, the next slide is a snippet of video from um, Steve Blank, and we can talk about it in a bit. Can you guys hear it? Interesting. I think when you share your videos, you have to press those two check boxes that say optimize video for. One second, Josh, one second. Okay, where do I go? If you stop sharing, 
uh, for a sec, and then share it again. But this time, when you see the window, uh, when you choose the window that you're sharing, there's two check boxes at the bottom that you need to turn on, and, and that will pipe the sound through your right. Zoom thing. I think. Uh, look at Josh being the consummate IT pro here, stepping up to provide advice. Worst case scenario, Bonnie, if we're getting stuck, we can uh, share the link uh, with the, the group after, but let's see how this goes. Okay. What's this thing? Anybody recognize this? It says business plan. Can you guys hear? Business plan. It's great. Was the book when venture capitalists said, go write a plan, you kind of looked at what everybody else was doing and basically a business plan was what you thought you were going to do. And it had a great appendix, Appendix A, uh, which had a five-year forecast. And surprisingly, all of them said $100 million by year five. <laughs> and in fact, if you really think about it, a business plan still to today makes all the sense in the world for your second, third, or fifth product in a large corporation because you have a series of knowns. But a business plan for a startup is really kind of different because in a startup, you don't have a series of knowns. You have mostly a series of unknowns. And this is a big idea because the only people in the 20th century to require a five-year plan for a series of unknowns were venture capitalists than the Soviet Union. <laughs> That's a joke. OK, write that down. Um, so one of the other things we recognized as entrepreneurs was that no business plan survived first contact with customers. Yet this was the only tool we had. And it kind of made sense, because most venture capitalists at the last quarter of the 20th century were either MBAs or financial types, and that's what they grew up with. And what's interesting was there was clearly no distinction between the tools of what a startup would need versus what a large company would need. We didn't even have a language to distinguish this two 16 years ago. And even more so, this was heretical. Large companies execute known business models, right? A large company knows its customers, knows its competitors, knows its channel, knows pricing. It knows that because that's how it got large. Yes, stuff will change, but yes, we're large for business models, but instead we were executing them. And so I realized that startups needed their own tools different from those used in existing companies. And so we came up with this idea called the Lean Startup, which is simply a risk reduction methodology for early stage ventures, nowadays not only for startups, but inside of large companies as well, and as you'll see later inside the government. And the Lean Startup has three simple components. One is, let's take all our hypotheses. Who are our customers? Who are the stakeholders? Who are the regulators? What are we building for them? What are their needs? What jobs do they want? OK, just going to stop sharing, um, because this is where I wanted to get at. Um, and give me one second here. OK, so let me just stop that. So this uh, framework that you guys see, this has not only changed what startups do and what they look like and how they execute, I have used this model to launch products in my company. And I've used this model to help companies understand. You assume a lot of people know what you you also know, but that's not always true. Things like feature value statements and um, ORs and business model canvas, um, that seems common knowledge is not, uh, especially in bigger companies. Um, uh, smaller anecdote is when I joined Cymax, which is a company I currently work. Um, my first day, I had to do a stakeholder presentation of a product launch that my CEO wanted to launch. So the two weeks that I had to basically relax before I joined my job, I had to research and figure out uh, what the MVP would look like and you know, the minimum viable product. And my presentation had elements of the business model canvas and 
feature value stuff that I learned in CDM. And you don't realize then, but no one knew that that kind of stuff you could apply, especially with their companies. And um, the reason I'm just sharing this story is because there might be things you think are um, stuff you cannot apply or in bigger companies, but you totally can. Um, just going to move on. Okay, I want to make sure I can use my headphones. Just give me one second. hear me still right Dennis okay double thumbs yes awesome. okay <laughs> I've got my headphones back and let me continue sharing the screen uh, and here we go okay so um, we've talked about CDM exploring um, orbits uh, um, so needless to say, we started Orbitz, but a year later we realized, um, based on our experience in the E at uh, UBC, that we didn't have a product market fit, or not the fit that we thought we did, uh, or a pricing model, which was the biggest thing, like how do you make money? Um, so we stopped um, and we closed shop and Orbitz, and we decided to look for jobs. And we were all students, um, we also needed the money. Um, and that was when I stumbled into um, kind of a few of the assumptions that I used to have and um, some of the lessons that I've learned pretty significantly. So um, C7s, and I think maybe all, all cohorts, and I can't just say it for mine, but we were very ambitious. If you asked anyone who came into the program where you wanted to work, they were like, I want to work in Disney or Pixar or an EA, which is totally possible, or um, an Apple, or um, Ubisoft, and Valve. Like, they had, the, the, we came with like dreams that no one could shatter, and we're like, we're gonna get out and we're gonna get a job in that company. So I'm just gonna crush some of those assumptions, not all. Um, Dennis, please don't kill me. But um, <laughs> here's, here, here's some of those. Um, a lot of people have asked me this before they're thinking of joining CDM that do you actually, do you get a job? Does that help? Um, answer is yes, absolutely does. I don't think there's any denying it, but will you get the job, the one that you've dreamed of and you've come to CDM thinking you just, all the logos that you've seen in Sony, probably not. Um, can you get into a managerial projection position directly out of the program? You most definitely can't, but you can intern in a similar position where you can learn the skills and apply, especially if you're switching careers and if you're not done management before. Um, can you switch careers? Absolutely. I have seen people who have come in as um, artists, been working in UX, moved from graphic design. I've seen people work into games or not into games. I've seen people move into animation where they weren't. I have moved from development into product management and now into program. So the the short answer is yes. Um, is it hard? Absolutely. Like we didn't, you have to put like 120% into the program in learning the skills you need to learn, which comes from learning, not from the teachers, but the peers, everything, just being out there, talking to people and learning as much as you can. Um, and the last bit, I'm pretty sure Dennis has talked about this is, should you build your online portfolio? Yes, 100% yes, that helps a lot. I still use my portfolio. Um, it definitely gives you a level up. Um, so the lessons learned, I wish someone had told me this um, when I was there. Don't be shy to reach out to intros and information interviews. You have no idea how helpful people are here. Um, I have reached out to people, everyone's connected to everyone. First off, Vancouver is small and we've got an incredible alumni network. And the amount of people uh, who's helped me talk to people, um, even not a job, but get an information out of it. Um, no one has ever said no. And you, and I'm not lying about this. Um, keep connected, like use the network. It's very, very strong. And when I, may, when I say use the network, I don't mean go and just send a LinkedIn request. Talk about yourself, give an intro, explain your situation um, and help the person get the context. Um, I have 
connected with so many alumni that I don't even speak to sometimes, I don't even know. Uh, but if someone comes and asks me, hey, I see you connected to someone in that interview can, or in a company, can you help me understand that maybe they won't be able to refer you, but they'll definitely be able to give you, uh, help you kind of move forward in that process. So use that, don't be shy. It's a very accepted phenomena here. So um, just talk to people if you need to. Um, this one's a little difficult because I, it took me eight years to understand what that was. And this comes with the whole networking thing. Um, we, most of the people I know, all my friends um, in CDM, like we used to hate networking and Dennis would just push us to go talk to people. And we're like, oh my God, no, Dennis, this is, how do you talk about yourself to people who are so qualified, they're industry experts and you go in and you, I still remember the first time we went in and a networking event and I think I came back and cried or something because I'm like how do what do I what do I say about myself um, and it was awful because you you can't sell us if no one's interested in you uh, you still have to make an interesting conversation you can't talk about the weather but um, the one thing I did learn is you don't have to know what you are and where you're going in terms of your role but you do have to understand what your strengths are Problem solving is a strength. Collaboration is a strength. Um, curious, curiosity is a strength. Being frugal is a strength. And you, you can apply those skills across different jobs, across different roles. So don't worry or hesitate to talk about, hey, I'm a developer. I want to learn more about collaboration and I want to work with creative people. That's, that's it. You don't need to... Um, you don't need to be underconfident if you don't know exactly which industry you want to be in or an exact role that you need to be. No one wants to know that, honestly, trust me. Um, they just want to hear your story. What's your story? Um, I, coming to Canada from a country that is far, far away, that itself is a huge risk, especially in pandemic. That speaks to your character. That is already a story there, that you've moved from one country to the other, trying to learn something new. And that is a strength. It doesn't seem like one, but remember that that itself is a strength. And um, it took me a long time to understand and realize that. Um, so, so yeah, just remember your strengths and think about it. Um, don't worry too much about exact details of where those need to be and what you need to say. Um, get your foot in the door. Like I said, you may not get into a dream company, but I know people who have gotten there now. Uh, they didn't start there, but they worked their ass off to get there. So don't be disheartened if you don't, because we all, like all my friends, I think we went through a depression phase where we're like, oh my God, this is like not gone into any of the companies we wanted to. This is awful. Uh, but all of them were happy in even the companies they thought they wouldn't be in and that wouldn't, uh, it's not their dream company. And some of them have been very pleasantly uh, surprised, not pleasantly, maybe unpleasantly surprised of having preconceived notions of the companies they thought would be a great working space, roles that they thought that'd be great and it didn't work out or it worked out and they were unhappy and they moved back. So there's all sorts of things, but the point here is just get your foot in the door and you can walk towards whatever it is, but don't expect it to come immediately after CDM. Um, it's done going hand it off in a platter. It might, um, but if, you, if it doesn't, then don't worry. Just Vancouver is like, you have all these brilliant people who are connected to. Um, if you're hardworking, you know the right people and keep working at it, it's possible 100%. Um, so now that we are kind of nearing um, towards the end a little bit, um, I want to talk about who I am and um, what I do. So I, like I mentioned, I was a developer and I came to Canada like eight years ago. Um, right now I'm the program manager of an e-com company called Cymax and I oversee the entire technology portfolio, which includes SaaS products, internal tools, um, over 10 marketplace integrations. Um, so I'm responsible for the strategy and execution of basically all technology initiatives um, in that company. Um, so what does a program manager's um, kind of day look like? Um, and I've heard this question a lot of times, people asking me. Um, so that's what my day looks like. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit peek into what it is. Um, I start at a nine o'clock with my daily huddle uh, with some of the department heads. This only happened post COVID because we were all remote and there was too much stuff going on. We were thankfully one of the industries where COVID helped. We were an e-com uh, e industry. We sold furniture online through Amazon and Walmart and our sales went through the roof, which was awesome, but also terrible because our system started breaking. 
So I had to kind of go in the front lines and start having these daily huddles with all the department heads to make sure we were all kind of aligned, like almost immediately if something went wrong. Um, then I move on to my team of PMs and leads that I speak to um, and make sure we are all up uh, just kind of follow up on that meeting to make sure if there are any actions that they need to know they need to take. Um, I kind of try to do that. Um, the rest of the day goes on um, planning and launching initiatives. So I'm responsible for quarterly plannings and kind of launching the strategies uh, and initiatives that we talk about. So a lot of meetings go on just planning that uh, and some of which I've used um, the business model canvas I spoke about um, kind of to map out a few things when I'm launching new products or new things. Um, a lot of scoping meetings, um, we talk about future initiatives, um, how big, how small, a lot of impact analysis meetings. How do you know whether this product or this project is going to do well? A uh, very little bit of work time uh, to start hoping to document some of that stuff that we talk about. Um, status meetings on current projects. Um, because I deal with a lot of future and uh, I need to be forward thinking. So there's a lot of meetings around the direction and strategy that the company needs to take where I need to be aligned. Um, and hopefully not a lot of SOS meetings that we call, which is just when shit hits the fan and you need to get everyone together. So that's kind of what my day looks like for the last 10 months now, because I've been in this role beginning of the year. Um, anything you want to add, Dennis, or talk about before I move on? I'm just nodding along because that's a lot of meetings. And it's, I, I, <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, you know, on the, on the biz dev side of things too, it's a lot of meetings. I'm just gonna, but um, it's... Uh, very interesting too because you you came into this organization with a technical background and moved into mm. program management and we had andrew von rosenbach who's came in as a philosophy major who's actually in the <laughs> apple and you know so it's I'm kind of, there's certain trends in that problem solving communication that the skill sets um and then the ux design sensibilities too i was connecting with uh jonathan um earlier about a ux role but anyways i just see the strengths that you get um, from the program and also touching on your point about that, the job or the dream job. And you're right. It's having the expectation or the goal is, is great. I mean, to think about it, but being open to taking the steps to get there because all those companies you've mentioned, we have grads at now, right? I mean, do they get it right out of the gate? Not necessarily. Some people based on where they're at in their careers, connections, pre-existing, you never know, but so many of the grads can get there really quickly because they have the right ability to, sell their strengths, communicate, have the online portfolio, make, have those networking abilities to, to, to climb the ladder. Um, mm -hmm. So, it's, uh, and Iza was a great example because she shared that, you know, volunteering at Spark you talked about, but you know, she yeah. volunteered at Seagraph and she was able to, you know, she got her gig at Mr. X in Toronto, right? And mm -hmm. then she was able to now, you know, work her way up to, you know, getting awards and screen, you know, uh, Canadian screen awards and being nominated for an Emmy. And it's like, couldn't be prouder, fellow C7 and uh, I think yeah. your wedding too. So it was the- Oh uh, yes, <laughs> you missed that. Yeah, I did, I, 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 I still regret that to this day, but I did <laughs> get the invite. Anyway, I'll just go back to you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Dennis. Um, we're actually nearing the end. Um, I just want to leave some time for questions. So the last bit, I want to talk a little bit more about my journey in the career that I've had over here after Orbitz. Um, so after Orbitz, uh, the first job I got was an internship at Global Relay. And the only reason I got that job was because I had a failed startup. And I can say that 100% that the reason they hired me was because I had that experience of just knowing how to build a product and iterating and learning how to fail. And there was an exercise. Uh, I still remember that exercise was if you are at a lemonade stand and uh, your CEO comes in and says that you need to build one lemon, you need to build like a similar lemonade stand and sell lemons, what do you do? And that was kind of a product management exercise that I had to do. And if I wouldn't had, if I didn't have orbits and that experience, I wouldn't be able to even understand how to structure that problem. So that was that. I did that for nine months uh, and my contract wasn't renewed. Uh, and the feedback I had was I wouldn't be able to say no to the CEO if I was a product manager then. And I was working in an internal project and that crushed me because I'm like, yeah, I haven't even seen the dude. Like, how do you know I can't um, say no in a project like that? But um, I definitely took that in. And that's one of the things I'm glad that happened because that just stuck with me. 
And in my current company, my CEO calls me Bulldog because I'm known to say no to everything that he says. Um, so from then on, I actually started working in Vidigami, which was because of an alumni. And I got the job there as a product analyst. Everything that I learned in Global Relay, which was awesome. And honestly, I couldn't have a better experience. All my product management skills, I applied to the Verigami. It's, kind, it's a photo management uh, software where we manage photo and video content for parent community. It was a startup. I came in as a product analyst. Some of my biggest failure stories came from there, which is equally important because when you're out there, um, you don't need to know your success stories. You do need to know, but not all of them, but you need to know your failure stories as well. Uh, most importantly, what you learned from those. Um, I launched a new module in Virigami, which uh, was supposed to have X amount of forecasted revenue, which I'm not gonna say, and that didn't even hit 10% of its mark, and we were delayed in the delivery. It wasn't a far, um, it was one of the biggest failures in my career. And I think it's one of the best stories that I have that I can discuss with people when they question in interviews um, about what I learned from it. And there was a big learning lesson on understanding how the products out there, you don't have to build every product. You, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You could integrate with things that already are, that's out there, which was kind of one of my learning lessons. Um, but anyways, in Verigami, I got to do, I became kind of the all in all all powerful product person. So I, I could make all the decisions. I set up processes in Agile. I um, ran the quarterly meetings. Um, I did what I thought was best. And that was one of the reasons why I left the company because I thought there was so much more that I could learn. And um, there was, I literally was that honest and all public. I made most of the decisions. I set up most processes. And uh, after a point, you understand that there might be a better way to do this. And I was still learning and I needed to learn. So I moved into Cymax which is my first day was a stakeholder presentation about a new product that I had to um, launch. So I started off by managing one product, which was kind of the brainchild of the CEO at that time. Um, we sell furniture online. So the product was to um, basically collaborate and engage with the design community and the designers to help create kind of sets and different pieces that they could sell online. Um, in six months, I was tasked to manage two products um, after a product manager left. So then I was managing the tool um, and um, product which was building an e-commerce website. So like Shopify that you guys have heard. So I started managing that. And then I started managing three products in I think 10 month time or year and a half uh, where um, we were also building a Shopify ad at which, at which point I kind of had a mental breakdown and which was a great learning lesson because the key here was um, you also need to know your limits. I was taking on too much thinking that I could actually execute and it, there is no harm in telling, going back and saying that this is humanly not possible, um, which I did, but after that thing, after that episode, and they were super supportive and they actually helped me build my team because they're like, you know, you still need to do it, but we just need to make, make sure you have people under you to kind of move, make you, you don't have to um, do everything yourself, have that support system. So then they build out that be that kind of team that I was looking for. And um, two years ago, I launched um, Channel Gate, which is one of the products, um, one of the most successful products in um, the e-com industry where you can actually launch and publish products in Amazon and Walmart. And I doubled the revenue in year over year, which was pretty incredible because I had no idea how to do that. Um, and that's when I became a pro program manager because I managed kind of the onboarding, not only the MVP, the product, but also the onboarding training support, like that whole thing that makes a program successful. Um, and then um, this year I am now actually managing the SaaS kind of the channel gate, which is a SaaS platform, plus the, all the other products that are in, that is in the company. Um, which includes the tools that we have integration. So just making sure my, my entire job is making sure every single department is aligned to every single technical initiative that we're doing and throwing money at. So we're actually spending the money at the right places. And that's kind of where it is right now. Um, I have a team of PMs uh, under me, an analyst, um, business analyst and project managers who help kind of execute um, all of this that we just talked about. Um, and I never thought I would be doing this, but somehow I ended up here. Um, this is like your story is, I mean, you've been talking about that 
product you were launching within Vitagami that in the failure to, you know, this triumphant uh, launch of a successful product launch, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a great story and it represents that resilience and the bulldog nature, I guess, whatever we want to go with. <laughs> you've had, you, you've earned your successes. Um, now, did, did you ever think you'd be working in, say, like a, the furniture, like space, right? I mean, Oh my God, no, I never thought. Well, this is, again, the digital, we were touching on this last week, like, or in, it's, it's really, it's everything. I mean, this is the, the golden ticket to, in, every industry needs digital media minded people. And I mean, I, I wouldn't have guessed it either, but I mean, like, I'm so impressed at what you do. I'm only uh, kind of jumping in here because we have to get to the Q&A because I have to, you know, stop within the next few minutes so that the students have time to get to Jason's class. I know it's like a <laughs> thing. But, uh, you know what? Go ahead, because this is the last slide and we've talked about it. it was quickly three big takeaways. Um, explore stuff in CDM. If you hate net networking, which most of you do, find a partner to make it fun. Um, and the last one is just learn how to build your narrative and you'll be fine. Great. All right. So everyone, I mean, it's to you now, too. If anyone has a question for, for Bonnie, I think you're, you should be able to unmute yourselves and ask the question if you'd like. You can also use the chat window if there's, uh, you know, use to your discretion if you'd like as well and um yeah again it's uh, this was all very solid advice in the sense of you know make the most of these connections the informational interviews the you know connecting in a in a meaningful way with people not just uh, the, the, just a direct uh, linkedin ping um all of that makes so much sense and networking can be completely scary and i liked i mean the idea of the networking with a buddy thing is so true it's like if you can go to a place and you speak with one person and I speak with one person and then you introduce and you're doubling your networking abilities, right? So, yeah. I mean, yeah. we did that because after our first depression episode, I think uh, so me and my friend was like, okay, you know, we had a challenge where we were like, we have to talk to three people by the end of the night, regardless of how bad it was. And um, it was a small thing, but it did make a difference. Yes, it totally does. Yeah. And then um, how's life been settling in Vancouver? Like, did, was that uh, always part of the goal or did you end up um, just making the decision that, you know, this is a good place to be or? Um, honestly, I think I wanted to be in, like subconsciously stay in Vancouver. It's just like everyone said, it's one of the most beautiful places in the world, which is 100% true. Um, but I think the journey that I've taken, I wouldn't have thought I would. Um, I didn't even know what product manager meant meant at the time that I was a product manager. It was just an up and coming idea, especially here, not in Silicon Valley or anywhere like that. They knew what it was. Um, there wasn't an actual program or a certificate course that you could do and that kind of moved into product management. Um, so yeah, I, I think it all worked out, but I didn't really, re I didn't really think I would actually take um, this role because I very specifically didn't want to do two things which was once a developer because I'm like, I did that and I want to do something else. And second was, I didn't want to be a project manager. Um, and now a lot of what I'm doing is, um, I didn't realize there was a middle way where I could be a product manager and uh, look at kind of execution without being a project manager. So yeah, it's, it's, it was, it's interesting. No, and I love that. I mean, it's, you're often, you know, creating these jobs or rules based on, you know, it takes some time, but you find out what you don't like, what you're good at, you know, what you can <laughs> implement and the confidence to, create these opportunities and that, you know, I think you've definitely done that. So good on you. And, uh, you know, again, this is, um, I don't want to say a common story, but it's like, it's, you know, it's if, for those that put the effort in, I think you're rewarded with, with that. And I mean, mm -hmm. you and a number of your classmates and I mean, a lot of the MDM alumni network, it's, there's a common thread there, but, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to say, yeah, thank you for everything, Bonnie. And we will, have a proper thank you and we can get back together in person and, you know, and, and, uh, <laughs> but um, for everyone else on the call, um, you know, thanks for joining. I know a number of you have class right after this and we're all living in these zoom windows. I'm starting to see some virtual hands there too. And the, but uh, yeah, this is the, you know, it's a, uh, this is the our the zoom class of 2020, 2021. I don't know where we're at right now. And this is my second bedroom that looks like a stage, but it's, it's, it's <laughs> That's what keeps me going is like, I feel like I can, uh, but yeah, anyway, it's um, been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Thank you, everyone else on the call. Um, thank you, Josh. <laughs> there you Definitely are. Stepping up with the IT. Yeah, there you go. You got the, the, the live wave. Yeah, the live wave. Yeah, and there's Yay, Kristen. there's Kristen. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, the funny thing is this, I mean, this was a lunch and learn session. Many times I used to host these like at 12 and yeah. I was always like, hey, if you need to eat, eat. It's not <laughs> waiting for people's dinner right now too, but I'm like, it's the, uh, you know, anyway, this is, uh, it's a drink. Actually, now it's, it's, uh, you know, happy hour, I guess, or, you know, it's, uh, all right. Why not? <laughs> <laughs>